Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Al Boykin. All right. All right. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a, hope you had a great lunch. And uh, hasn't this, this weather been nice the last few days, huh? Yeah, I put in a, a, a great request for you guys, and, uh, and it's, it's been delivered. So uh, it, is, it is all good. So listen, hey, this is our, our last plenary uh, session for, for this event. And if, uh, so when I look at, you know, what's transpired, what's, you know, the conversations that we've had over the last couple of days, you know, with the panel yesterday and uh, Mr. David Cade this morning, wasn't he pretty awesome this morning, y'all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and General Holt on yesterday. So this gentleman right here is, is someone that we've grown up with uh, over our, our career. When I say our career, Charlie and I both. And uh, just so that y'all know, we're going to have a Q&A session. And I think Charlie and I both are going to come up and uh, we want to have a conversation with, with John because uh, we've been listening to you and we've been listening to the other speakers as well. And we have a lot of questions that we want to ask ask John, and he's excited about answering those questions, and he wants to hear from you all uh, as well. So it is, uh, it's good to be back. It's good to have John as our, as our wrap-up speaker for this, for this session as well. So we're honored to, honored to have Mr. John Tanaglia uh, as our 2022 uh, summit closing speaker, if you will. Uh, John currently serves as the Director of Defense Pricing and Contracting, or what we call now DPC, there at the Pentagon, out of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, John is responsible for all of the pricing and contracting with over a $300 billion uh, portfolio and annual obligations. Uh, he is the functional leader of DOD's 30,000, 30,000, uh, contracting professionals uh, around the world. He's the principal advisor to the Under Secretary of Defense for acquisition and sustainment on all acquisition matters and procurement strategies. So when, you, when we talk about and we hear about all of these policies and the new procedures that's coming about, all of that's coming out of John's office. And he's got some, he's got some key folks in there and He'll probably talk about some new initiatives that's, that's on the horizon as well. So he oversees all of those key initiatives for pricing and policy and all of the DOD procurement uh, regulations. Uh, John was actually commissioned in the Air Force. So uh, he, he, uh, he served in the Air Force and retired out of the Air Force. Uh, in 2008, he retired uh, off of active duty. You probably heard General Holt talking yesterday that the Air Force it's taken over, right? So, so John, is, John is a part of that. So we're, uh, we're all a part of that as well, uh, myself as well, uh, but it's all exciting. So I recall that, uh, you know, when General Holt was talking about that yesterday, he and, he and John actually worked together on a lot of these key initiatives. And I think that John will probably speak to some of those things uh, as well. John has been a, been a member of the Senior Executive Service since uh, 2014. And uh, again, we're just so excited to have him this afternoon as our closing speaker. So please help me give a, a great round of applause and welcome to Mr. John Tanaglia. Thank you, John. Appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you, Al, for that kind introduction. And thank you and Charlie for inviting me to speak to you all this afternoon. I've really thoroughly enjoyed uh, sitting in the breakout sessions, hearing your questions, trying to absorb how this all comes together. Uh, it's quite a challenge. I've been inspired uh, by, by what the speakers have had to uh, say, uh, particularly this morning. Uh, David uh, shared with him just a few minutes ago my appreciation for him sharing that very personal story and making it relatable to what we are doing here and how we can work together as uh, industry and government officials uh, to really trust one another. And uh, so I just wanted to lend my 
uh, support and uh, agreement with, with that concept. And hopefully, as we talk about some of these uh, topics that are, are on, uh, on our env in our environment today, how we relate that trust environment uh, to these issues. So I do want to thank uh, Charlie Williams as well and Joe for challenges, challenge, challenging us at the beginning of the week to use this opportunity to learn and to grow. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing to develop our contracting and pricing professionals. And attending events like this is exactly the type of thing that we need uh, people uh, to engage in. So I'll just, I'm going to go down the list here with some of the, the topics of, uh, of most uh, interest, uh, I think, to you all today. Some of the uh, work products uh, in terms of policy, uh, tools, initiatives that my office in Defense Pricing and Contracting works on for your behalf, on behalf of the Department of Defense, our contracting and pricing workforce, and just the, the enterprise in general to help, help make it go. Uh, you heard from General Holt yesterday, we do live in a very complicated and perhaps overly complicated uh, ecosystem here, bound by uh, compliance rules, layer upon layer upon layer of compliance requirements. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today about what our office and DPC does to try to manage that as best we can. And uh, let me just kind of go right into it by describing what our office does. So DPC, as uh, Al mentioned, informally called DPAP. Uh, we took the policy out of our name, even though we did, we still do a lot of policy. A lot of the output you see from our organization, uh, the DFARS is probably the most visible uh, aspect of, of what we produce. Uh, I, could, I could give you a whole hour description of the rulemaking process and, and how that plays out, uh, but I'll, I'll just touch briefly upon, uh, upon that aspect. But as I mentioned, you know, we really exist to support the DOD components, and that's the fourth estate, the military departments. We have close ties with DCMA, DCAA, in, in helping the departments execute. Obviously, my office doesn't execute any contracts. We don't have any warranted contracting officers, but we have the people that support those warranted contracting officers and pricing professionals. So in doing so, we, we're required to uh, uh, update our procedures, perhaps to streamline them where we can, uh, try to influence the process uh, towards uh, simplicity where we can, and that starts with our engagement with industry and with the Congress. Uh, just this morning, I had the opportunity, uh, actually over the last two days, two different uh, indus industrial association engagements that I uh, conducted uh, via Zoom from, uh, from here in the hotel. Uh, this morning with the coalition of, of with the coalition for government procurement which is an organization that's designed to cater to companies that sell through the gsa schedules primarily uh, so on their minds they wanted to hear about the inflation guidance so it took them through some of that and some of the other uh, policies uh, that are in play right now and then yesterday engaging with the professional services council uh, and uh, aia as well last week so in doing that really a part of that is is maintaining that trust environment by describing what it is we're trying to achieve with, with our policies and how we can find some common ground where we can. Uh, a lot of the policies that we might advance uh, are perceived to be uh, slanted a little bit towards protecting taxpayer interest, and, and that's always going to be true. Obviously, in the pricing business, uh, we're about trying to get the best and the, and the most fair deal for, for the warfighter and the taxpayer and industry knows and appreciates that as well. But in doing that, in, in engaging with the Congress or with industry, uh, so a lot of times our positions are at odds and, and that's, that's just uh, the elephant in the room sometimes. I was talking to, to Charlie about uh, the way we interact with the industrial associations and we, I, I'm really proud of the fact that we have an outstanding rapport with the, all the associations. We have open door policy, we have a quarterly meeting uh, with, with the various associations that come together. We have an open dialogue. They challenge us uh, for some of the things that, that we're doing. Uh, they use that opportunity to try to influence uh, uh, appropriately so, the rulemaking process and where we might go and opportunities uh, for comment. I'll talk to you about a good example of that here uh, in a few minutes when I talk about the contract financing uh, policy area. We, you know, DPC really is not a very large organization. We have just a little over 30 permanent uh, members assigned, assigned to the organization. And that's, that's 
Uh, perhaps not enough to get the job done, but I know many uh, in the committee would just prefer we not have more so we don't promulgate more policy. But I can assure you that almost all the policy that, that we promulgate, almost all of it, does come from the statutes. The annual National Defense uh, Appropriations Act uh, in, in Title VIII normally comes with 20, 25 uh, different provisions, some, sometimes around that many, uh, could be less, maybe a little bit more. But he, many, many of those need to be translated into the regulatory process, and I know this sounds bureaucratic, it is, uh, and it's deliberative by nature. Uh, policy, uh, if, if, you could, if you could turn on a dime with, with policy, probably wouldn't be a good thing. We'd, we want to have some consistency in how we operate. But there's no question about this layering effect that, that we're all living with. If you, if you, on the receiving end, as a contracting officer or a pricing official, that's trying to make sense of all this, uh, I know it is overwhelming. I did have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to lead in, in the, more on the execution side of the business recently when I was at the Defense Health Agency from 2017 to 2020 and really uh, gained a, a newfound appreciation for the amount of burden, as uh, so we talk about compliance burden, that our system does levy uh, upon not only uh, internal government staff, but certainly on industry in the form of, of the clauses and other requirements that you have to adhere to as a function of wanting to be a uh, contractor with the federal government or with the DOD. So some of that influence that, that we have, and right now we're in the markup season for the Congress, uh, for the uh, Armed Services Committees are going through their markup process. I would say my staff is spending a, a significant amount of time uh, responding to what we call requests for informal views. Uh, last month, I think we, we processed 50 different views uh, requested by professional staff members asking for our opinion about how a uh, proposed legislative uh, bill language might, might be received by the department. So I appreciate the fact that the department does trust our organization to speak. Now we do have leadership channel uh, that we flow our, our inputs through. Uh, but DPC has really earned an outstanding reputation, and I'm just honored to, to be able to be part of that organization. It's a long-standing, uh, uh, high-performing organization. And part of that really is being responsive to, to the staff members who are being uh, asked by their members uh, to advance legislation that affects the, the procurement uh, world that we live in. And uh, so this week we have uh, another flurry of, of activity uh, with amendments being filed and uh, requests being made to have us weigh in on some of this bill language. And so this is a particularly active time of the year for us, but uh, I, I wanted to convey how our organization does have the opportunity to influence that on the front end. Similarly, and this administration, the Biden administration, has certainly used the lever of the federal procurement process to try to advance the, the policy objectives that the president uh, seeks to advance. Uh, you all have seen that. Maybe you don't uh, read all the executive orders that uh, the DPC staff uh, digests and offers comments on the front end. Again, we're trusted by the administration to review uh, advanced copies of the executive orders before they're signed. And we influence uh, the language of these executive orders uh, where we can uh, to try to make the point that we have an existing system that is already burdened with uh, so many compliance requirements. Uh, did, would you think about maybe adjusting this a little bit here, a little bit there? I want to give credit to Scott Callisti in particular. Uh, Scott is going back to the Air Force. Uh, you heard from General Holt yesterday. General Holt has uh, asked him to be his deputy, uh, and so he's going to go do that. Uh, and General Trevino coming in here next month behind General Holt. And so Scott will be the, the, the deputy at SAF AQC. But over the last two years, Scott has been at the point of interacting with the, the, with the White House staff, which includes the Domestic Policy Council, the National Economic Council, OMB, the Office for Federal Procurement Policy, and others, policymakers who are advancing the president's management agenda in the trenches, offering feedback about what language and, uh, might be helpful or harmful to the department's mission. And if you see a lot of these executive orders, they have the tasking that asks the Federal Acquisition Regulation Council to promulgate a rule to implement, you know, whatever portion of, of, of the policy 
uh, that's there. And so we have a a uh, growing list of requirements that, that will go through the federal acquisition regulation system that flows from those executive orders. Made in America is a, is a good example of that, certainly affects our procurement system. In the wake of the, the COVID pandemic, realizing the vulnerabilities we have with uh, foreign sources, uh, emphasizing uh, the need to bring back onshore as much as we can. So that translates, not necessarily a, a, a pricing issue, Although, when you break down the, the, the contents of any given proposal for a weapon system, contractors now have to meet a higher level of uh, domestic content. And that's just one example of an area where Scott was intensely engaged with the National Economic Council and the Made in America office. He was, he was engaged with Ms. Drake uh, this morning, who leads that office. And, and so that's the kind of impact that this small organization that we call DPC uh, does. We engage, we have a great relationship. Uh, speaking of trust relationships, I've, I've built up over the years a, a great trust relationship with a number of the senior members of the GAO staff. They provide uh, critical uh, advice uh, to the Congress and in doing, so in doing that work, offer recommendations that we generally accept and, and try to advance and improve our procurement process. And so I wanted to acknowledge that, that part of our oversight community. The DODIG, uh, I think David Cade mentioned this morning, and I won't uh, name names, but you might have seen a, a testimony that I offered earlier this year uh, that, that followed through on an, on an IG uh, recommendation, a uh, series of recommendations, and the policy implications uh, for what the IG uh, identified with respect to pricing of, of spare parts. And finally, our, and, and this is not an all-inclusive list of, of stakeholders we engage with, but these are some of the ones I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, you may or may not know that our office also manages what we call the reciprocal defense procurement agreements. And these are the, uh, the agreements we have with 28 of our closest allied nations. And it's for the purpose of holding neutral uh, their own domestic uh, preference laws with our Buy American Act. And that matters, especially when you get to this new regime of 75% content required for the Made in America, uh, the content of any uh, components that are provided by those 28 nations, those qualifying countries, count as U.S. domestic content. In order to do that, we maintain uh, the agreements with those nations. So that's just kind of a, a rough sketch of, of what our office does on your behalf. So let me kind of dive into some of the specific policy matters. And, and like I said, our office is primarily a policy organization, so these are a list of, of kind of policy-related uh, items some tools as well and capabilities that we're deploying for the, for the efficiency uh, and economy of the, of the workforce. But let me start with inflation. Uh, I, I sat in on one of the, uh, a couple of the breakout sessions where this, where this was mentioned. And obviously we are facing, uh, unfortunately, uh, extraordinary uh, inflation right now. The, uh, the intent with the guidance memo that we issued a couple weeks ago, and if you haven't, um, had a chance to see that guidance memo. What I've done, I won't show you the backup slides, I'm just gonna stay on this one slide so you see the list and then uh, think about what questions you might wanna ask. But, you know, when you get all the slides for all the presentations, I've included in my backup slides references and links to all what I'm talking to you about so you can go back and refer to the, to the source documents, including the inflation memo, including the training. We have a link to the DAU training that we just deployed last week. And I think the significant part of that training is really we're making it available to not only the DOD acquisition workforce, but to industry and the general public as well. And so that's important because we want to level set the understanding of what can and should be done to deal with the, the uncertainty and, and the balancing of risk associated with inflation. And so at the, the heart of the memo, and most of you probably had the opportunity to see it because I know this is, this is an issue that, that all of you are uh, tracking pretty closely, <clears throat> is the need to really encourage uh, contracting officers to use economic price adjustment. There is a reluctance, certainly, uh, to use economic price adjustment and there hasn't been a need. It's an example of an area where we 
probably adding complexity to any given contract is certainly an area that, if not done properly, will likely result in litigation down the road uh, where we have ambiguity. How do you go about doing an adjustment? If that's not clear, uh, that will eventually play out in a litigation setting, and we none of us want that. The thing, probably the most significant part of the memo was perhaps the part that talked about request for equitable adjustment for uh, existing fixed price contracts. And I realized we tried to choose the words uh, in such a way that didn't come across as, as tone deaf or, or you know, uh, callous to the situation. But from a contract law standpoint, there's, there's just not the avenue to use the REA process uh, to reopen uh, fixed price contracts for, uh, for inflation. Uh, I can go into the reasons for that, but that, that is probably one of the, one of the most uh, significant aspects that you probably would take away from that memo. But I do want you to take away the, the point that we're trying to encourage the use of EPA. Now, with that comes uh, an understanding that to actually use this, our workforce is going to need a little help. So uh, you all probably know uh, Ms. Janice Moskov, who heads our uh, price cost and finance directorate with NDPC. Uh, she was recognized, I believe, a couple years ago by this organization. And Janice uh, stands ready to train uh, a cadre of trainers. We have at DOD, and I think lower on the slide, you see a, a, a cadre, pricing cadre of experts. Some of those experts are in the room today. Um, so it's a federated structure whereby we have experts within the components that, that can help our contracting officers structure these EPA clauses in such a way that makes sense. Let me move on to commercial item pricing. I mentioned uh, our interface with the industrial associations. Uh, this is an area where we probably have not seen eye to eye. Uh, and so this is probably an area ripe for what David was uh, describing as uh, seeking some common ground through, through trust. Uh, I would like to convey that we are seeking what I would consider modest uh, change uh, to the existing statute that addresses how we go about doing commercial item pricing. Specifically, uh, and I, I said in a breakout session uh, that, that Bill and, and Steve Troutwine, I believe that was the one Bill and Steve led, uh, how much data is enough? And that, that kind of is the heart of the commercial item uh, question. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, references uh, to that here. And, um, and David referred to it as well when he talked about you know, how, much, how much compliance uh, burden is really enough. This is, a, this is an element of trust. How much do you need to demonstrate to a contracting officer that this item truly is commercial or that the, this, item, uh, this price that I'm offering for is, is a fair and reasonable price? And so what we're seeking currently with the recognition that the longstanding definition of the commercial item, including of a type, in the statute is, is that's settled law uh, in the sense that uh, the Congress is, uh, I'm sure, not interested in, in reopening that, although you will see some bill language uh, uh, that's coming through this week, individual members who, who may have um, designs to, to make some changes in those area. That is not what we're necessarily pursuing. What we're pursuing is a very narrow request to do two things. One is if there is an analogous part, and if you saw my testimony before the House uh, Oversight and Reform Committee, you heard me talk about uh, analogous parts to of a type part. So if a part is being purported to be an of a type commercial part, I'm just asking that, that uh, the company help the contracting officer arrive at a commerciality determination. I was just talking to Charlie Williams, who le really deserves a lot of the credit for starting the commercial item group within uh, DCMA, and we work closely with, with that group because they're the ones that are driving consistency in these determinations across the department, advising PCOs. And so what we're asking for is language in the statute and perhaps a subset of the statute, perhaps one that only would apply to weapon system components. We'll see uh, how that shakes out. That would say, if you are selling a, of a type product, 
Show us what is the, what is the analogous part that you're, you're holding up to be the commercial part that you're anal, anal, analogizing to. If there's a national stock number for that, for that other part, show us that so we can make these comparisons. This is common sense. We're already doing this. Uh, and, and where we can, part of uh, the motivation, frankly, here is how can we move through that process quicker? Because, and I think we can recognize there are situations, and I'm, I'm not ascribing blame to either uh, industry or, or government, but we bog down in these things for six months or more, and that's just churn that, that is not helpful uh, for people on the requiring side of our business that, that need uh, need the components, whether it's in the spare parts world or you know, whatever environment we're in. But I think we could all agree that getting to a commercial determination sooner, getting to a fair reasonable uh, determination it sooner is in everyone's interest and that's really what we're seeking. So that's on the determination side. <clears throat> on the pricing side of commercial items, we're suggesting that if there is sales data, and this, you might say, well, this is already, there's the language in the existing statute addresses this. We're putting a finer point on this because we're encountering situations. Uh, and I'm not going to paint a broad brush and say this is happening, you know, all the time. But we're encountering situations where if there is sales data, just show us the sales data. Show us the unredacted sales data so that we can make that uh, determination. David Cave made an excellent point this morning about, about trust when it comes to that. Some of that sales data, and, and you, you give us the, the best example of any that I can think of uh, with the sensitivity of that information. Uh, we have American companies that we want to be successful competitively in, in the world market. The last thing we want is for American companies to be disadvantaged because we uh, have escapes with the information that is not only proprietary, but highly commercially sensitive. And so there is that need. How can we protect, if we're given that information, how can we uh, be trusted with that information in such a way as it's not going to get out? So that's in a nutshell what, what we uh, have with commercial item pricing. We continue to work with the DCMA group. Uh, there's some, I'm gonna talk to you about some uh, tools we're trying to, to make to enable communications across the department. Um, there was a, a description earlier this morning about um, inconsistency, and we, we continue to probably be inconsistent. We're a very large department. As, as Al mentioned, we have 30,000 people that do what we do. And so the opportunity to have some uh, divergence in, in what things, how things are approached, uh, and that's really on, on the leadership team. And I'm, I'm proud to uh, serve alongside leaders uh, that you heard uh, from earlier this week, like Meg Dake in the Army and Cameron Holt and Cindy Shaver in the Navy, and then and all the leaders of the fourth estate. Uh, part of my responsibility is to kind of bring that community together and not that, you know, DPC necessarily sits at the top of a pyramid as much as, you know, it's a council of, of leaders who are working on behalf of the department. Uh, they have most of the workforce, so that 8,000 I mentioned already, we only have 30. So they have the, <laughs> the rest of the 29,000, yeah, whatever the, the delta that would be. Don't make me do the math of that. <laughs> so so uh, that's commercial item pricing. I mentioned to you Janice Muskov. Uh, and so we had the opportunity recently, uh, where I sit in the Pentagon has some proximity to the Deputy Secretary's office and uh, actually had the opportunity to engage with her. It probably doesn't happen uh, very often with uh, someone in my position as a civil servant. Uh, but in some of the, the COVID impact uh, issues, had the opportunity, uh, had the highest respect uh, for Dr. Hicks. And her staff approached me, and they have some, uh, some discretionary funding that, that the Deputy Secretary has. And, and we had a discussion about what it is DPC does and how small we are. And so and how could we do some more of what we do if we were given just a little bit of a, uh, a budget plus up to do that? And what we led with was what Janice does in terms of uh, pricing consulting. And so we laid, laid out actually what we called it a proposal. It was very well received by Dr. Hicks and her staff. And it just talked about what are the tools, uh, what are the, the subscriptions perhaps that we need uh, for services uh, and uh, access to experts like the Navy price fighters uh, to help us do should cost and analysis. What are those things that we can do to help uh, the pricing community if we just had a little bit more. Janice has two civilians, 
uh, that worked for her. And so that gives you, a, and this is, this is DOD uh, pricing policy and, and uh, not more than pro policy, it's, it's more advice and consulting. Uh, if you've heard Janice talk, she, she talks to you about the, what we call the peer reviews. Um, looking to maybe uh, use the word consulting a little bit less or more than, than reviews because we, we want people to know uh, we have this expertise in, in not just Janice, but uh, in Sarah Higgins and, and Leslie Overturf. And we have a couple of uh, acquisition exchange uh, program participants in the audience, in, in Greg and Keith, who are aligned to Jeff and appreciate DCAA and DCMA uh, sharing uh, Greg and Keith with us for the better part of the year. But that's, that's what we do. We, so we weigh in with negotiation teams, uh, Janice does offering her advice. She's, she's been through uh, sole source negotiations uh, throughout the course of her career and seen how we can get through that process in a more efficient way. And so the resources you'll see in my backup slides have links to a lot of the specific tools and resources that, that Janice and the PCF part of DPC uh, has to offer. And I think they're useful for not only for the industry, for the uh, government uh, audience here, but also the industry audience. You may have heard, for example, she has a sole, sole source pricing toolkit that has a number of streamlining initiatives to, to get through that process. And so I would commend that to you. Contract financing. This has been uh, perhaps a, uh, what do they call, the uh, third rail, one of, one of these third rail topics. Uh, you all know that we increased the uh, progress payment rates uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic the, uh, and have remained uh, at an elevated rate uh, uh, since that time. Uh, you also know that we have a, a new uh, undersecretary in Dr. Bill LaPlante. Uh, and as the political leader, uh, I've had some conversations with him about contract financing and what we're doing. I want to share with you uh, some information about that. So really this goes to uh, what, what matters, and, and I think David uh, and others talked about this well when they said, you know, it's important to understand what does motivate uh, industry and industry executives that are really making decisions. And certainly cash flow is probably right at the top of that list. So how, uh, how can we consider that in, in the equation? There's been a history of, of some policy pursuits in this area, I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, but that kind of started where, we're, where we are right now with this contract finance study. Those policy pursuits uh, ended up uh, being followed by a GAO report and a recommendation from the GAO that said, you know, the department should really revisit the, you know, the whole uh, contract financing uh, aspect. You should do a comprehensive study on this. And so that's what we're doing right now. We've engaged academia. We've had three... Uh, inputs from universities, uh, University of Virginia, University of Tennessee, and George Mason University. And we have an inputs from one of the FFRDCs, IDA. This morning on the Federal Register in what they call the pre-publication notice, there is a list of five questions and sub-questions that will be published tomorrow. And uh, also in my uh, list of, uh, of references in the backup slides, that link where you can go Google it yourself and say Federal Register uh, Contract Finance uh, Study. And so now we're at the phase of the study where we need to hear from the public and from industry. Uh, what, what do you think about the current state of the contract finance? And when, it's not just progress payments, as David Berteau uh, reminded me this morning. You know, it certainly includes uh, other aspects, performance-based payments. We haven't seen a lot of interest or activity in performance-based payments since we increased the progress payment rate for reasons that you would expect. Uh, we do, uh, you may have seen in the press, and we, that's the other thing DPC does, is we answer a lot of press inquiries about uh, the procurement business because uh, all the organizations of the department end up spending uh, $386 billion last fiscal year. Uh, that, gets, that gets the interest of the American people. Uh, and so the press asked questions like, well, what is this uh, increase in progress payments? When are you, when are you going to revert? Um, and so the answers we, we have offered to the media are you know, we're reviewing that, uh, trying to understand the economic impact of that. How are those, how is the benefit of that cash flow actually 
being received in the industrial base to include uh, down through the supply chain. And so we're working with DCMA uh, to really kind of present that picture uh, for, for Dr. LaPlante uh, to consider and see, uh, do, we, you know, do we continue you know, the current, uh, current approach and how much longer do we con continue that? But we have, in addition, this, this uh, contract finance study. And so because tomorrow we'll be issuing that request for information, if you have uh, thoughts on uh, those questions, you don't have to answer all the questions, but uh, we certainly would appreciate uh, your input on that. So that's contract financing. Workforce development. Uh, I was, uh, on, uh, had the, um, uh, I, I was appreciative of, the, of my predecessor in Kim Harrington, who did a lot of the work in the last administration to lay the groundwork for what we put in play uh, just this last year under what uh, former Undersecretary Ellen Lord called back to basics. And for the contracting function, back to basics is really about streamlining the level or the, the number of uh, courses that are required for certification. Uh, I heard one speaker earlier this week talk about, you know, we rush people through uh, in, in the old environment, uh, you get level one, two, and three certified in the first three and a half years, and then you don't have the requisite experience to go along with the training that were, was in those level three classes. I don't fault the, the people. I think the people that, that the, the students that wanted to get through that process, I was probably one of them that said, uh, let, me, let me get to level three as quick as I can and, and get it over with type of thing. But it's not, in, it's not consistent with the theme of, of lifelong learning. Yes, we had continuous learning hours. We've always had that as a requirement. But so what we're moving to is let's, let's educate and train our incoming uh, contracting professionals uh, military and civilian, in the basics of what they need to perform uh, the, the contracting and pricing function, consisting of four basic classes. But, and this is the most important thing, and so you might get through that in the first couple years of your career, but not only those people, but everybody else expected to take advantage of what we're now calling credentials. And in the backup slides, you'll see I've lit, laid out all the credentials that are associated with the cost price finance function. And I give credit, great credit to Janice Muskov and Dr. Renee Butler at DAU for really setting the example, not only for the contracting field, but the subfield that is pricing within the contracting community. And so they have either deployed or near deploying 14 credentials, and each one of these credentials consists of a set of courses. And it's really the professionalization of our function. I mean, events like this, uh, NCMA events, this is about legitimizing and professionalizing our function. You know, what we do is, is complicated, and we need to have uh, to be refreshed uh, in terms of the latest uh, techniques um, that these credentials will offer. And so uh, I'd really appreciate the strong partnership we've, we have with the Defense Acquisition University, and I would commend. Uh, so I want to also recognize James Malloy. I think that's you, James. I'm struggling to see you through the lights. Uh, James offered for me earlier this week, and I put it in my backup slides. Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> uh, James gave me a spreadsheet that lays out very specifically. There's some courses, uh, a lot of the courses in the pricing credential series are available to industry and the general public. Uh, there are some that are not because there are licensing issues, uh, but for the most part, a lot of that, those pricing courses, including the inflation course, are available uh, for, for the whole audience here. And so uh, you'll see in, in the backup spreadsheet exactly which courses, which credentials uh, you can access. And I've given you links to the DAU sites and to Janice's website that has a lot of this training. Speaking of workforce development, you might have heard, and, and, and this could be a little bit old news because Janice probably talked to, uh, to you about this last time, but the Striking the Balance series, and I think that remains consistent with the theme we're talking about here. Trust, striking the balance, to me, means just enough uh, compliance to make sure that we're getting a good deal, but not too much. I think uh, Bill and, uh, and Steve yesterday, uh, that was their, their lead line. They, they showed the excerpt of the FAR that said, uh, just enough, but not too much data. I didn't exactly get that quote right, but. Uh, so striking the balance means how do you, how do you get uh, just the right uh, data or just the right information uh, to strike the deals that we're talking about. And so that whole series is based upon that philosophy. And you'll see 
in, in the links I provide, all these webinars have been recorded, you know, for posterity and for us to go back, you know, we don't necessarily have time to see these live. Some of them are 60, 90 minutes long. Uh, but take a look at that list and see what, what, what's uh, helpful for you. You've had a lot of the same material that's been covered uh, this week. Uh, but, you know, if there's some, some overlap, perhaps, but there's probably some other areas like, uh, well, there's one on performance-based, I won't go into all the detail, very uh, economic order quantity, uh, use of FPI contracts, just a, a, a nice uh, series that, that we offered. So we've, we've, we've pretty much uh, uh, completed that series in the sense we don't have uh, new uh, seminars that, that we're offering now. But this summer, we have a, a summer series uh, that we're uh, participating with, DAU and DCAA, that's targeted to the small business community. And how do small businesses navigate through uh, the proposal process or the audit process? And so there's um, eight or ten different uh, offerings uh, that you'll see through the summer. If you didn't have a chance to see the ones, the few that have been offered already, they're, they're on webinar tape, and you can go back and, and look at those. So it, uh, particularly for the small business uh, interest, uh, take a look at that. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of time, and I certainly want to associate myself with, um, with what Joy White uh, talked about in terms of, uh, well, and, and Cameron Hold as well, speed to market. Uh, but Joy White also uh, talked about, you know, the, the timeliness of the deal. And a lot of the nature of what we're talking about here is the pre-award uh, environment. There's, there's some post-award administration discussion, but I just wanted to acknowledge that, that certainly there's a whole other... Uh, there's a lot of other sub-communities in, in our community. I spent um, the week with uh, Lisa Romney, who heads up our uh, contracting e-business uh, capability and the procure-to-pay uh, part of our business, uh, the connections with the financial community. That's a whole, and maybe some of you have participated in, in that as well, but that's a whole other almost specialized niche community, and, and they make uh, you know, our contracting offices go because that's the engine behind it. And how, how can they, and I'll talk to you about some of the tools that, that Lisa and her team uh, deployed. But this comes back to Streamline. So why are we Streamline just for the sake? No, we're Streamlining so we can get capability uh, to our requiring official, to the warfighter uh, faster. I, I happen to sit in an organization and uh, the uh, Undersecretary for Acquisition has a major focus on major weapon system programs. We're right now in the midst of trying to provide Ukraine with combat capability. So our defense industrial base is, is contributing significantly to the, the Ukrainians' ability to hold off uh, Russian uh, forces. Our ability to deliver that capability in a timely manner actually matters. And if you heard President Zelensky, days matter. And that, I mean, so it's, it's kind of a vivid uh, reminder to us all how much uh, time really does matter. And, and I, you know, I, I'm not even gonna attempt to uh, articulate, you know, the threat as, as well as, as General Holt and, and Joy White indicated, you know, the threat is real and the timeliness with which we deliver this capabilities actually matters. And so whatever little part we can play here and there to reduce uh, the time to get to award because it's, and that's just one part of it. Uh, we talk about Paul uh, and I think I, I'm echoing a lot of what uh, General Holt has to say ab about Paul, you know, that's, that's one part of it. You know, and you hear him talk about the PPE -E process, you know, the time to actually get to an RFP, uh, that, that's, you know, sometimes out of our control, but that really uh, matters when it comes to uh, the overall total acquisition lead time. But what we can do within our community streamlining initiatives, we have the Tina Light uh, that I have listed here. This is an authority that uh, we sought, and that's another thing that our, that our office does that I, I didn't mention. We advance legislative proposals, and in almost all cases are seeking positive authorities to let us get through the process uh, in a more uh, expeditious manner. Tina Light is a good example of that. It's an alternative to Tina. Separately, the Congress asked us to look at alternatives to Tina, but for the time being, we have a pilot that's in play now that says rather than use certification uh, in the traditional method, uh, let's, let's use the actuals and call it good with, uh, with, with the actuals that are submitted, if you will. Uh, a little bit more to it, but that, that's kind of what it amounts to. We have five or six takers in industry so far. This requires contracting officers and 
uh, individual companies to willingness to say, yeah, let's, let's go ahead, we'll be part of that pilot, we'll help you demonstrate whether streamlining that is something that we, as with any pilot, would it make sense to institutionalize that across the board. And so that is available, uh, and I would encourage uh, for the members of our industry uh, audience here, if that's not something you're familiar with, uh, feel free to contact uh, Janice or I, take a look uh, at, the, at the, uh, the framework that goes behind that and what the alternatives would and see if that's a, an attractive option for you. CSO stands for Commercial Solutions Opening. This is probably one of the, the more significant um, in, in my last tour with DPAP uh, accomplishments, and I, I won't take too much credit for this because I credit Victor Deal. If you read the NCMA magazine, you see that he's written about the commercial solutions opening. I credit uh, Stuart Hazlett here for, for hiring Victor, uh, and I've uh, stayed in contact with, with Victor through the years, but it was his idea uh, and he looked at the broad agency announcement process and said, well, we need like an apps-like approach to access innovative technology. And the law doesn't currently, or back in the 2015 time frame, doesn't allow for us to use the BAA process for other than research. So how can we apply that same concept in a source selection process? And you saw this play out with uh, COVID requirements. Uh, you heard Meg Dig talk a little bit about what the Army uh, did in support of COVID, she was being modest. I mean, the Army executed the lion's share of what now the running total is $80 billion of requirements for therapeutics, uh, testing, vaccines, uh, PPE, uh, all of what HHS uh, needs to defend the nation in this pandemic. Uh, the Air Force and, and others contributed, but the Army really stepped up. Uh, and they stepped up, and the Air Force used the CSOs as well. And, and so this is a technique, uh, proud of the fact that we not only convinced the Congress, Victor and I, that this is a new authority uh, we could use to, to get through the process, articulate your requirement in a generalized way, like you would with the BAA, and just select whatever commercial alternatives uh, make sense that, without getting into a comparative analysis. And you see where uh, much the same as the BA process is streamlined, how we could use that to our advantage. And so not that that's gonna be used for, for everything, uh, but that's a significant uh, tool that I, I try to use forums like this to, to make the point that uh, we really need to take advantage of the authorities we have. And that's really been the, the message that I've received uh, from Dr. LaPlante early in his tenure. Let's take account for the authorities that Congress has given us and, and really make sure that, uh, that we're using those to actually deliver capability at full scale and not just, you know, these uh, prototypes are good, but eventually, you know, you need to deploy full scale capability. So that's CSO. Source selection procedures, we haven't had a lot of uh, discussion this week about the, the competitive source selection process. Uh, and there's some discussion about, you know, uh, deviation from standard and what does is, what is one com DOD component look like to industry versus another. When Stuart was with DPAP, we, we put in play the uh, standard source selection procedures to, to try to normalize how we go about, how do, you, how do you establish evaluation factors, terminology with source selection to try to put all of the department on a somewhat uh, uh, normalized uh, footing so that we're presenting ourselves to industry in, in, a, in a common way. You can expect in the coming weeks we're going to be issuing an update to that guidance. Not a lot of significant changes, but what we're highlighting there is an appendix that celebrates these streamlining approaches. And you heard uh, from some of the speakers this week whether it's, I mean, the draft RFP process is nothing new, uh, but reminding people that that is certainly something we ought to be doing. Um, and so that issuance is coming out. Again, guidelines intended to be helpful uh, to try to present ourselves to industry in, in more of a, a common way. Other transaction agreements, again, a, a technique more on the instrument or the vehicle uh, side as opposed to CSOs being the, the source selection process, and that was also widely used. You know, as we, we think about, are we up to the challenge? And yesterday at lunch, Charlie Williams mentioned, you know, we, we, we can do this. We did this for World War II, for, if you read Freedom's Forge, you know, just a reminder of, of what, how this nation mobilized to the, what was then the threat. And, you know, picking up what General Holt talked about yesterday, can, can we really, can we get the attention of, of all the, the players in the system that, and, and rise to this challenge? Uh, one way to do that is, is to use uh, these authorities, whether other transaction agreements, 
Uh, we've used those for COVID and the execution. We've used uh, some of these uh, techniques to rapidly respond to the requirements for Ukraine. Rulemaking, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. We want to get to uh, Q&A, but that's a big part of what we do, and it is uh, what endures, right? Because what really matters for contractors is what, are, what clauses are you imposing in the contract that we're going to have to uh, adhere to. E-business capabilities, I don't want to sell this too short, but I do want to, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about how are we using uh, uh, robotic process automation, we're using... Uh, whether it's AI, maybe not so much AI as the, what I would call big data automated tools. This was the second of the two proposals that we offered to the Deputy Secretary. And this was also well received. Uh, and what you'll see in the backup slides are the use cases that all fall in the pricing arena. Things like how can we do uh, analysis of bills of material? How can we ask industry to present their bills of material in such a way we can adjust that and do uh, more efficient analysis, taking the human out of the loop with, with some of that analysis where we can. Uh, Janice is sponsoring a, a data symposium next month with, uh, I believe Greg is help, helping to, to lead that. And so exploring with the DOD components, how might we leverage big data tools to, to be more efficient in what we do? And so Lisa Romney is leading a lot of these other initiatives. The catalog data standards, one that we'll roll out, uh, I would expect in the coming weeks. And just m moving more towards uh, a Granger-like uh, ingesting information about products that are sold in the commercial marketplace so that we can understand and see and do pricing in a more uh, streamlined manner. And finally, Lisa leads the RPA Working Group and in collaboration with the DoD Components. Looking to see, you mentioned, or you, Meg, you heard Meg talk about the DORA bot, which is determination of responsibility. Those types of functions, we have an 889 compliance bot uh, that helps our contracting officer do a quick check of 889 compliance. Uh, so those, those types of things, and looking to see what we can uh, deploy across the department where it makes sense. But a lot of those tools are, you know, at, at the ground level being developed, and really it's, it's understanding how we can uh, incorporate them in our existing business processes. So I see we're, time, we're at the time for, for questions, and I get to sit in the comfy chair that has looked so inviting all week. So, uh, But I look forward to your questions. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John. Man, I, I like how you brought it all together, <laughs> the, all of the different conversations that we've had uh, over the... Over the last couple of days, just yeah, how looks you... Like the, looks like the spotlight's on John right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not nervous, are you, John? <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, so Charlie and I thought we would, we would come up together. I, I should say, I, you know, sometimes they do softball questions. I, I didn't get any... Uh, uh, John, we're going to ask you this. No, no, this, so, no, this, no. This, this, <laughs> it's not happening here. Maybe we'll be quite as uh, rough as uh, <laughs> Dr. Wooten is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I gotta, I gotta tell you, John, there's a lot of questions. Okay. A lot of questions here. And I, I think we just like to start it off with, so this morning, uh, David Cade was talking about uh, this idea of trust mm -hmm. and between government and industry. We'd like to get your thoughts on that. Are we, are we better off now than we were, say, 10 years ago? Or what, what are your thoughts on this, this concept or idea of trust? You know, I think David made an excellent point about, and Cameron as well, about the recrimination culture. And, and you see this in overall society about the, uh, the effects of social media. Um, I myself, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I consider myself fairly thick-skinned, but I can't help but uh, look at the uh, you know, secondary reporting on issuances that, that my office uh, uh, puts out, like the inflation memo. You're not going to please everybody, uh, and, and uh, it is... Um, you have to be confident in, in what you're doing is, is right and you're transparent about it. Uh, but in terms of the trust, uh, and so I, I shared with Charlie, we uh, were backstage, you know, I have uh, formed a, a good rapport with the associations, as I mentioned, and in particular had the opportunity for one of the senior representatives of one of the associations. And we talked about how we can get to common ground with some of these policy initiatives. There, uh, Items or issues like commercial item 
uh, pricing policy. Mm -hmm. there, there's mm -hmm. going to be a natural tension, and so I, I, I don't think we're ever going to eliminate uh, that tension. Uh, I subscribe to the, the, the partner concept. There's been those in the past that say, well, no, we're not partners. We're, you know, we're certainly not adversaries, but, but we're, you know, we're uh, arm's length negotiation. I think somewhere in between. So granted, in the policy world, uh, it's different. So we're not negotiating dollars, but we're essentially negotiating uh, policy and, and trying to influence the same people that are ultimately the decision makers who are the Congress in, the, in this case. And so uh, where we can find common ground, I found that, um, you know, I come to those conversations with a trust mentality, and I know this particular person uh, does too. And what that means is being forthright with uh, information. Uh, and so you earn people's trust uh, by demonstrating through your actions and are consistent with your words. Uh, and that's important because, you know, the, the, your professional reputation doesn't last very long if you're, if you're going to be yep. inconsistent there. So, and then, so drawing on my time at Defense Health Agency, I think um, from the execution standpoint outside the policy realm, I, I think that the, the, that particular agency is currently led by uh, Lieutenant General Place is, has a, a good relationship with industry. We have the, the primary uh, uh, providers that, that drive uh, medical health in, in, the, in the Department of Defense have a, a good open relationship and a trust relationship uh, with the senior leadership. So it really kind of boils down to the tone and tenor that, that the leaders are going to set. Got it. So, so, John, there's a there's a couple of questions here, or several questions here, that I think get to this concern from the small business perspective about things that happen policy-wise or otherwise that impact uh, the ability of small businesses to to conduct business uh, with the government, you know, whether it be you know. So, so what happens uh, in a fixed price contract where we're having inflationary pack, uh, pressures and and those small businesses in the supply chain are significantly impacted. Mm -hmm. What happens to a small business when you're requiring uh, CMMC requirements and those kinds of things? So, so, so you talk about these kinds of things, and then we talk a little bit about barriers to entry for non-traditionals, such as requirements for CPSR uh, in an evaluation process. What are we doing to try to remedy uh, unnecessary barriers uh, and avoid the, the, the impact? And I think there's some statistics out recently that uh, the, the, the number of small businesses doing business with the federal government has decreased significantly. Any thoughts on, on where we can go or what we should be doing in that area? I do. And so we have uh, an important partnership with, with our sister office, NDPC, the Office of Small Business Programs. Farouk Mitha is the OSD Director of Small Business Programs. And remember, just in the last 24 hours, had an email exchange about that uh, very thing. He participated in a deputies council uh, this week. Uh, the deputies council is the deputy, the deputies of, of the cabinet level organizations uh, in, a, in a forum held by uh, White House staff promoting exactly what you, what you just described there. How are we uh, looking out for uh, that part of the industrial base and for, for DOD, the defense industrial base? Uh, Roxanne Banks, I don't know if, if she's still here, but we, we've had discussions about the fact that some of the fragile industries uh, that support DLA uh, are, are having a most difficult time overcoming, uh, not just inflation, but before inflation, uh, wage uh, uh, impacts. Uh, we have a new federal minimum wage, and those types of impositions of, of those, and in that case, it's a little bit different because that's a, that's a government-driven requirement, but what actions are we going to actually take? And, and so Farouk uh, shared with me uh, an action plan. So we've been, we don't want to be just admiring this problem. What specific actions uh, can we take? And if on the cybersecurity uh, front, uh, his office does have, uh, through the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, uh, free advice uh, for, for companies. Uh, I signed a memo out just this morning reminding contracting officers about the NIST 800-171 uh, requirements while we're waiting for CMMC to come into play. Uh, but Farouk is, is offering the small business community uh, free advice for, for navigating. How do you comply with, with the, that part, those, those standards? But the issue of uh, attracting new entrants and, and what, you know, uh, acknowledging the fact that the small business vendor base has 
gone down. There's a number of different reasons for that. I, I'm not sure if you see that the dollars that have gone to small business have, have held mm -hmm. uh, steady, but the, the number of different small businesses we contract with has gone down uh, drastically over the last uh, 10 years. Is that due to consolidation in the small business sector, perhaps? But this administration is very much interested in uh, advancing the small business agenda, and I can show you that's getting um, the attention it deserves and with specific strategies uh, like, like that, the one I mentioned for uh, cybersecurity, but there's other approaches we're putting in play. Okay. John, there's a, there are several questions on, you, you talked earlier about the uh, developing the professional workforce, right, and the changes that's happened uh, with DeWea and all of the, the DAU changes and now uh, the kind of revamping of the competency-based courses that uh, back to the basics. But this is an interesting question about uh, uh, skills-based hiring versus degree requirements. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is, 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 is that something that's emerging? How important is that idea from a, a skill-based hiring uh, process versus degree mm -hmm. requirements? When I heard that question yesterday, uh, I didn't disagree with what, um, I forget who answered the question, uh, uh, but I didn't disagree with the, oh, it was uh, Cindy. Um, not Cindy, but uh, Nancy, excuse me. Nancy, uh -huh. <laughs> right, right, right. Nancy. Um, I agreed with what Nancy said, but she answered the question from the, in the context of the government workforce. That's what I wanted to address okay. from the contractor workforce. Uh, for the same reason, I, I just signed out a memo a couple of weeks ago, and I, I don't want you to get the impression that I sent out these memos just kind of willy-nilly and just like, oh, yeah, this is just a <laughs> memo palooza, no, as, as no. Kim Harrington used to call it in the COVID <laughs> period. Uh, a lot of these memos that you'll see are... And I say I, we need to be selective and judicious about guidance memos because after a while, you people just tune you out. And uh, so, where it is called for, in many cases, to be frank, we agree with a DOD IG or a GAO recommendation that will issue you know their recommendation, issue guidance. Okay, we'll issue guidance. I like to say you know the guidance that we have, and, and, and I agree and understand what uh, General Holt said about reducing uh, guidance. Uh, particularly component level guidance, but uh, we do have a, a DFARS and we have a uh, PGI, uh, which is the, that mm -hmm. guidance, procedures, guidance, and information. Uh, and so the, 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 the guidance memo that I issued is on the subject of unduly restrictive places of performance. Now, it does happen to respond to FY uh, 22 NDA section 875 that says, you ought not unduly restrict contractor required place of performance, especially what, what COVID has taught us that we can accept uh, service acquisition performance from afar or wherever. You know, a lot of these services, it really doesn't matter where you're performing from. Right. And so in the same manner, I would say, put that in the category of unduly restrictive requirements. Unduly restrictive requirements for education, uh, certain levels of, uh, you know, so for an IT specialist, does it really matter if they have a master's degree? Probably not. But if they have a certification, that might mean more. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, there, there has been uh, a move towards, uh, you know, removing those unduly restrictive yes. requirements on contracts. Yep. So, so John, let me take you back to the discussion on inflation, because th this is a big one, right? And, you know, you've been hearing questions. You know, admittedly, we're in extra uh, unordered or unusual times, right? We, we haven't been in this, at this level of inflation in maybe 40 years or so, right? And so the question becomes, are we getting to a point where, uh, so you talk about these fixed price contracts, are we getting to a point where maybe some extraordinary relief is necessary? I mean, 85, 804, mm. I've heard that discussion uh, advanced, uh, that, that we've got some really, really big contracts out there where they're fixed priced and, and we all thought it was the right thing to do at the time, but uh, mm. it creates some significant challenges. And so maybe there's some time to start thinking about something more positive. I, and I'll, don't, don't be offended by this, but I have a colleague of mine who said, well, all John should have said in his, co in his memo was uh, just go read the FAR, right? Mm. So when we talk about, <laughs> did, did, we tell, did, did, we, did we make anything happen uh, in this area of inflation just by the memo? Or do we need to do something extra and different? 
Well, so, I mean, the word extraordinary, and, and I'm not sure if, uh, because we're at unusually high inflation, uh, requires us to invoke that authority across the board. Uh, so what comes with that is uh, you know, whether the department is funded uh, to take that on. I would say this, uh, the discussions I've had with the senior contracting leaders, they know that that is an avenue available to them. Uh, we chose to not specifically call that out um, uh, as a conscious uh, choice, uh, just because I didn't want to elevate expectations that that's going to be a card that we uh, intend to play. Uh, now it's always, if so if there's schedule relief or other uh, what I would call creative um, uh, working through uh, the, the known impacts of, of inflation, uh, contracting officers have the ability uh, to do that. Uh, that particular authority requires higher level approval, of course, but that, that is certainly an option. I just don't expect um, what we're seeing right now that it's going to be used that frequently. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Charlie, if I can take the last question. Uh, I've got like 10 more here. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, I'm sure you get, the, uh, you get the question all the time about the TINA threshold and mm. the $2 million. Yeah. Uh, or, so, is there anything on the horizon that's going to change that, that will increase that? Any, any insight you can give mm. us on on thoughts there or, or not? Um, no, I don't know. So we, we, we're not advocating for a change to the TINA threshold. Uh, it was recently increased. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have the, the pilot in play. That might inform an increase to the TINA threshold, perhaps. We have a study that's going on right now, as many of you know, that have been contacted by, by the people at George Mason University. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to understand what alternatives that we might uh, consider. You know, it kind of comes back to the acknowledgement. If you look at um, the, the definition of commercial item is, and, and, and I think David said this so well. I mean, yes, we could, we could describe, you know, most of what we buy in the subcomponent level as commercial. Certainly services are almost, I mean, you could almost always find a service that's, Commercial, so that takes uh, Tina out of play because it's an exception, obviously. But no, there's no. I would say that the the pilot and the study could perhaps in, inform an increase, but we'll let that play out. All right. Well, John, hey, really appreciate your time this afternoon. Really appreciate you bringing everything together. And uh, everybody, join me in uh, thanking John Tanaglia for his time. And man, really appreciate you. Yeah, doing a great job. Man. Appreciate Thanks, you. John. Thank you. All right, so this is our last plenary session and uh, you know, y'all give yourselves a round of applause. You all have just been, been so Can we awesome set the lights speaking. up in the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanna see everybody out there. Can we cut the lights up, turn these <laughs> things down? I can't see people. There's a few remaining, right. yeah. And some are sitting in the- uh, The reason the, I wanna see you is because I'm just trying to make sure I can take a picture and make sure you're back next year. <laughs> Yeah, some are sitting in the back of the church there. That's great. Uh, yeah. So, hey, it, it has been uh, great. We have really enjoyed being with you all uh, here this, uh, these past three days. And hopefully, uh, and Charlie, I've, just, I've really enjoyed working with you this week. Love you, man. It's been a pleasure as usual. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And look forward, to, uh, look forward to working with you uh, later on on the next one. You all have, uh, I think, one or two more uh, workshops. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see you all at the, the gala this evening. A couple, couple, couple announcements I want to okay. make. Uh, I want to make sure, don't forget, we really, really, really value your feedback. I hope you've been using the survey tool, getting, giving us your survey input uh, to the different sessions that you've gone to uh, and so forth. And oh, by the, by the way, you don't have to leave us until next year. Uh, <laughs> just, just join us online at propricer.com. You get some webinars that we do throughout the year. By the way, you got a copy of the, of the pricing magazine in your bag. That's a quarterly edition that comes out. Uh, if you want to contribute to that, don't forget you can contribute to that. We always look for articles that we want to put in the magazine, but it's a great tool, great tool. for the professionals in our business. So, so stay tuned and stay in touch through those, through those sources. Yep. Mark your calendar for next year. See you here next year. All right, guys. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. 